Hello everybody, and welcome to Introductory Psychology. Today we're going to be talking about memory and the current psychological models of memory. So, without further ado, let's get started. So, I think a good place to start is asking, what is memory? I'm sure everybody has some preconceptions of this, but let's define it more accurately. Psychologically speaking, memory is the mental ability to retain and recall past experience. And this is based on the mental processes of learning, retention, as well as recall and retrieval, all of which we'll get to later on in this chapter. So, here's the basic memory process. You essentially need to go through encoding first, then storage, and finally retrieval can occur. So, part one is encoding. This is defined as the process of converting physical stimuli into a form that the brain's memory system can interpret and use. And I don't know about you, but at first that definition is a bit confusing. So let's use an example to make it clear. Say you're driving home in your car and you hear a really catchy song that you begin to hum along to. How exactly have you memorized that tune? What is the first step? So remember the lecture last week when we talked about how sounds are basically just the air vibrating? Well, since music is sounds, music is also just vibrating air. So this song is just vibrating air and it doesn't mean anything to our brain at first. However, once it vibrates into your ear canal, your ear interprets or encodes it in a way that your brain can understand and use. And then after that, you gradually begin to memorize it to the point where you can hum it. Okay, so now that we know exactly what encoding is, let's talk about the types of encoding. The first one is one that you should sort of already know, because it's acoustic encoding, and we just talked about it. It, it deals with sounds and spoken words, so the sounds of music in the last case. It can also work for spoken words, like if you're trying to memorize what your teacher said during a lecture, or you're trying to remember exactly what your mom told you to do after you walk the dog. Stuff like that. The second type, though is different than sounds because there are many more stimuli than just these sounds. We can also see things. So the next type of encoding is called visual encoding and this deals with images and mental snapshots. Now let's just stop for a second and close our eyes. Everybody got their eyes closed? Okay good. Now think about your bedroom. Just think about it look at it. where's the bed where's the desk all of that stuff just imagine it in your head okay so is everybody able to imagine their room or a room okay so if you have that then you have a mental snapshot of your room you've interpreted that information and you've remembered it so you had to encode it at one point so that's basically visual encoding visual encoding also works for images too so if you're just looking up pictures on the internet, you're using visual encoding to remember those. Okay, there's one final type of encoding, and that is called semantic encoding. And this one's a bit trickier to understand. It's basically used to deal with general meanings, which can be more accurately described as concepts and ideas. So, here's sort of a funny thing that I actually just realized. If we're trying to figure out and you're trying to remember what the concept of encoding is then right now at this very minute you are encoding encoding because encoding is a concept and you're trying to attribute it to memory so you're encoding encoding get it <laughs> anyway cheesy joke I know so let's continue one other thing you need to know about encoding is that there's a theory of dual coding and this says that if we use two types of encoding at once then we will have a better chance to remember this later on encoding will be more effective and to explain this basically explains why teachers will draw something on the board while they're talking about it because if you draw something on the board then you'll get the visual encoding for it but you'll also get the acoustic encoding if the teacher is talking about it. So then you'll have two ways to remember it in the end, and two times the chance of being able to recall it again. So it becomes more effective. It makes sense when you think about it. So let's practice a bit. 
What type of encoding would be used to memorize this picture of this super cute hedgehog? So I'll give you a second, just pause the video and come back with an answer, and then press play. Did you come up with an answer? The correct answer is visual encoding. Did you get it right? Okay, so let's, let's explain this a bit. Visual encoding is encoding of images, and since this hedgehog isn't talking, so there isn't any acoustic encoding, and the hedgehog isn't an idea, it can't be semantic either. So it's definitely visual, because it's just an image, that's it. So the way we remember it is we would visually encode it. Okay, that one was sort of easy. Let's try this problem. 2 plus 2 equals 4. What type of encoding would we use to memorize this? So, again, pause the video and come up with an answer. Did you come up with an answer? Okay, the answer is semantic encoding. Did you get it right? The reason behind this is because the idea of addition is conceptual, and it's a general idea. It, it doesn't have any sounds or sights that we would remember. It's just the idea of adding is combining those two numbers together. So it's most likely, it is semantic. Okay, how about this last one? And you're going to have to click on this link, view the video for like at least 20 seconds, and then come back with an answer. So go watch the video and come back with an answer. I'll be waiting here. Okay, so did you listen to that? Did you see it? Great. Do you have an answer? Well, this one's sort of a trick question, I admit. It's actually visual and acoustic encoding, so if you got that, kudos to you because you know this pretty well already. It's both because you are seeing the picture book, but you're also having it read. So because you're having it read, it's acoustic, but it's visual because you're also seeing it. So you, you're you remembering two different ways. So in the end, you're actually going to be more likely to remember this. Okay, well that's enough about encoding. Let's go on to the next step, which is storage. And this is defined as the process of keeping memories intact in the brain's memory system over time. And if you look at the picture right there, there's a guy, and he's got basically a safe in his head where his brain should be. I like to think of parts two and three of memory as sort of like a banking process, because when you're storing memories, you're keeping them in your brain so that you can withdraw them whenever you want later on. But until then, you want to keep them there, and you don't want to let them out. So let's go more specifically into which types of memories can be stored. Okay, the first ones are episodic memory, and these are memories of specific events or episodes. So here's an easy example. Remembering your seventh birthday, per se. It's episodic because that was a specific event, a specific day, a specific few hours, maybe. And it's definitely a time that you remembered. Okay, so let's move on to the next one. The second type of memory is procedural memory. And this is information on how to do things, like how to ride a bike, how to tie your shoes, even how to walk. It basically includes any of those how-to, step-by-step kind of things. And with these, repetition is the key. If you keep redoing them over and over and over again, you'll form the connections, you'll encode it, and then they will be stored. And another just fun fact about procedural memory is even if you suffer a major brain injury, procedural memory is so deep in the brain usually that you will remember all of your procedural memory, even if you forget your episodic or every other type of memory. Okay, finally, the last type of memory is semantic memory, and we know this well because it's basically the same as semantic encoding, except it's a type of memory. You're memorizing general knowledge and concepts now. It's not based on specific events like in episodic memory, and it's not based on step-by-step -step things like in procedural. And actually, if you think about it, semantic memory accounts for most of our memories because not everything is episodic or procedural. Okay, let's continue on. But first, there's a checkpoint. What types of memories are described in the following? Okay, here's the first one. The knowledge of how to take a shower. Which memory does this require? So just pause and take a guess. Okay, you're back. The answer is procedural memory. And this is because 
it's a step-by-step -step kind of process. You have to turn the water on, you have to use soap, you have to use shampoo, all of that kind of stuff, and you need to know step-by-step -step how to do it. So that explains why it's procedural. The second one is what memory do we use when we're memorizing information about Newton's three laws of motion? So pause the video again, come back in a second. Okay, did you come up with an answer? If you said semantic memory, you're right. Newton's three laws of motion are a general idea or concept. They aren't a step-by-step -step kind of thing, and they're definitely not a specific moment in your life that you remember. So the only one left is semantic memory. Okay, finally, the memory of going to Disneyland the summer before third grade. What type of memory is this? Okay, I'll give you a few seconds, so just pause the video. Okay, did you come up with an answer? The correct answer is episodic memory, because this is memory of a specific event that happened at a specific time. You have specific ideas associated with it, and it all took place at a specific point in time, and specific things happened. Okay, let's move on. The final part in memory is retrieval, and this is the process of locating specific memories in storage and bringing them into consciousness. So I like to think of this almost as a withdrawal from your bank account, continuing with that bank analogy that I made with storage. You're almost withdrawing the memories that you have stored, like, you're with, like you withdraw money from your ATM after you store it. So that's a good way to think of it, a good way to remember it at least. Okay, there are a few types of retrieval as well. The first type is called recall, and this is the unaided retrieval of memories. So, free response questions or oral exams are great examples of recall, because with free response questions, all you have is the prompt to go off of. You don't have any other cues or hints. You just know that you need to write about the topic, and you're going to need to pull knowledge from, from your brain to get this. Also, with oral exams, you're given a prompt, and you just need to work off of that. You have nothing else to go off of. In contrast, there is also recognition, which is retrieval with the help of hints. And this is easier than recall, and it's because you've got these hints that really help you. You don't actually need to pull this out of nowhere. You, you know you have, like, in a multiple choice test, you have a few questions, and you can be like, okay, well, this one sounds exactly like it. So it triggers your brain to think much easier than when you just need to pull it out of thin air. Okay. Now, there are actually two types of memories that you can retrieve. The first type is explicit, and these are deliberately remembered memories. You, con you consciously pull them into your thought, and you have complete control over this. On the other hand, though, there's implicit memory, and this is unintentional, and it's basically when your unconscious it is pulling memories and ideas which influence you based on your prior experiences. You really have no control over this. So, for example, consider this guy in the bottom right. He's, he's got this really big grin, these sharp slanted eyes, a top hat, that mustache, all those things. What do you think about that guy? He, he looks like a bad guy, right? Well, what makes him a bad guy or a good guy? He could actually be a really nice benefactor. Maybe he just likes his awesome mustache. Maybe he like he likes to stare evilly, that kind of thing. But on the other hand, we think good guys are Superman and handsome and all of that kind of stuff. But what's preventing one of them from being the actual villain? This is where our implicit memory sort of hinders us, because... It's inferences based on our previous knowledge, but sometimes they can be influenced by stereotypes. And so this this kind of thing works half of the time. It's meant to help us, but sometimes it really hurts us. Okay, moving on. So, now we're on the specific models of memory that psychologists currently have come up with. So, for the first one, we have the Levels of Processing Model, which is also abbreviated to LOP. This states that the quality of memory is based on the degree that information is processed. So, to explain, if you have more examples, so if you do more and more and more and more, more math problems, you get more chance to think about that idea and think and think and think. So you process it more and more and more. 
And then you'll be able to recall that memory easier because it is better stored and all of that. Also, another example of this is how you remember last night's TV show, but you don't remember, like, let's say, your lecture from yesterday. You talk about last night's TV show with your friends. You think about it right before you go to bed. All these things because you love this TV show. So you're processing it more than you would do with your lecture notes where you would maybe do the homework, but that's it. And you probably don't even care about it half the time. And it's important to note that quality means that the memories are properly stored, easily recalled, and not quickly forgotten. So basically, these are stuck in your memory, and they're going to stay there for quite a long time. And under the levels of processing model, there are two types of rehearsal. And rehearsal is the mental techniques used to memorize information. So the two types of rehearsal are maintenance, which is repeating information over and over in a way that you don't really make connections between ideas. You just remember specific things. So it's like rote memorization. You're not making connections. You are just memorizing specific facts to go with specific words kind of thing. Also, we have elaborative rehearsal, which is basically the exact opposite. With this, you relate new and old information and you build connections and it's proven that this is much more effective over time because you build these connections and because of these connections it becomes more ingrained in your memory because it's harder to forget unless you lose all of these connections versus with maintenance rehearsal where if you just lose that one connection between the definition and the word for example you lose it forever so here's a, here's an important connection question Consider the following situation. Joe is studying for his linguistics tests. He writes all of the prefixes he needs to know on note cards and memorizes them. Betsy, on the other hand, writes examples containing each prefix on her flashcards. Okay, now answer the following questions. What type of rehearsal is each student using? Who will most likely remember that prefixes are longer? And... How can you use your knowledge of rehearsal and the levels of processing model to study more effectively? So think about these for a second, and then we'll go over them for a bit. So just pause the video, think about them, write your answer down, whatever you want. Okay, you're back. So the first question, what type of rehearsal is each student using? If you said that Joe is using maintenance rehearsal and Betsy is using elaborative rehearsal, then you're right. Because... Joe is just writing down definitions, basically. He's writing down what the prefix means, and that's it. He's not making connections. Like Betsy, who is giving examples, and so she's using previous knowledge of words and the prefixes in words she knows to remember things in memory better. Okay, question number two. Who will most likely remember the prefixes longer? Well, I sort of got into this a bit. Betsy is going to remember things better because she's using elaborative rehearsal and she's making connections that are more likely to stay ingrained in the brain. Okay, finally, how can you use your knowledge of rehearsal and the levels of processing model to study more effectively? Now, I don't know exactly what your study habits are, but this model can really help somebody improve their grades, improve their ability on tests, all of those kind of good things. So I would consider this model, look at it a bit more, maybe research it even a bit. Figure out how this can help your studying, because it really can help you improve. Okay, the next model is the Transfer Appropriate Processing Model, also known as TAP. And this states that memory quality increases if, retrieval process, if the retrieval process matches the original encoding process. Uh, this may seem confusing at first, but it's actually pretty straightforward. So here's an example. Let's say that when you're tested on the information in your class, you are going to be tested by multiple choice. So basically, by the TAP model, you should study in a multiple choice format because that's the same kind of format so once you take it on the test your quality of memory will increase and you'll do better on the test because you'll most likely remember more on the other hand let's say that you read from the textbook to study instead of using multiple choice questions 
when you go to do when you go to take the test you might have some problems and it might be a bit harder to remember at least at the very least the quality just won't be as good as if you would have studied with multiple choice because it's a different type of studying they're both different and it, it the recall doesn't match the original encoding process okay the third model is the parallel distributed processing or pdp model this states that memories exist in a network new experiences alter this network and change one's knowledge base so right below i have a parallel distributed processing model for somebody's brain it might be a younger kid just because it's more basic things but who knows i have the head i have the headings of birds mammals and lays eggs so around birds i have flamingo robin roadrunner platypus and parrot the connection of flamingo is a it's black because it's a bit weaker than the connections between robin which maybe might have been one of the most one of the first associations that this person made with a bird so that's a bit weaker but maybe it's getting stronger over time we don't really know we don't have any examples of this we don't know the person okay so let's look at the mammal side under mammals we have squirrels elephants platypi and roadrunners do you see something that doesn't belong because i don't think roadrunners are mammals last time i checked and maybe that's why there's a black connection or a weak connection between mammals and roadrunners Maybe this guy's friend was just messing with him, and he's like, Hey, dude, mammals, roadrunners, they're totally one and the same. Roadrunners are mammals. So maybe he believed him, and so he formed that connection. But maybe he's in the process of breaking that, because he realized that it's not true. This is sometimes how we latch on to false memories. So we gotta watch out so that we don't make these false connections, because they're very hard to break. They take much longer than it took to form. Okay. Continuing with the PDP model, you need to note that more connections means that information is stored longer. So because we have more connections to the platypus, we know that the platypus lays eggs and is a bird and a mammal, we're most likely not going to forget platypus because we have three connections with it. However, on the other hand, where we've got flamingo, there's only one connection. It's only connected to bird so it is more likely to be forgotten in the long run also we need to note parallel processing which is essentially portions when portions of the network activate simultaneously and this is how inferences are drawn and consider this model again let's say that the guy thinking about this originally thought hey what other animals lay eggs so he started at lay eggs and then that activated the chain towards platypus and platypus in turn activated mammals and birds and then because of mammals and birds roadrunner got activated in this case it is a good inference to know that roadrunners to know that roadrunners do lay eggs because it's true however because roadrunners and mammals were incorrectly connected this could have been bad it might not have been true and actually, this is how a lot of stereotypes work, because we could have formed like a stereotype or a connection from a movie or something like that, and then because of that stereotype, we judge somebody who is like that when we do this parallel processing method. So that is definitely something to watch out for. Finally, there's the information processing model, and this states that stimuli must pass through sensory memory, short-term memory, and long-term memory in order to be stored well in the final memory. The first stage is sensory memory and this stage holds large amounts of information but very very briefly. It starts in the sensory registers which store incoming stimuli long enough for further processing to the short-term memory in this case and they only la the information only lasts for one or two seconds like I said very very briefly after those one or two seconds, if it is not processed into the short-term memory, it is forgotten for the time being. And basically, perception is when the information is encoded. And basically, if it's not percepted, then it's just forgotten. Finally, here's a really important concept. It's sort of a defense mechanism of our brain. It's called selective attention. It's when we focus mental resources on a specific stimuli. 
it's sort of like our filter. So it's like in a classroom where you're focusing on the teacher. You're not focusing on Billy and Joe back there who are talking about last night's baseball game, who are whispering and all that stuff. You're focusing on the teacher so that you can understand the lecture and be able to do the homework later on. So it, it sort of acts as a filter. And this is to prevent our brain against overload. Because if we could interpret every single sensory image, if we saw every single color, every single section that we were looking at, every single sound, our brain would overload. Because we simply cannot encode that much at once. Okay, let's try this little task. Let's memorize the following sequences in 10 seconds. I encourage you to play along. So first, memorize this one. I'll give you just five seconds. You don't need ten. Okay. Do you remember it? The correct answer is one, five, three. Okay, let's move on to one a bit tougher. That's enough time. Did you get it? Okay, getting tougher and tougher and tougher. Seven numbers now. Okay. Did you get that one? Okay, this is getting tougher. I don't even know if I could have done that one. Next. Okay. Did you get it? This is the correct answer. Whew. Sheesh, you've got a good memory if you can keep going this long. Next. Okay, first of all, before I reveal the answer, you are an incredible master of memory if you did remember this. Here's the answer. Okay, so stage two in the information processing model is short-term memory. And in the short-term memory, we can store seven plus or minus two items. So this explains why after we got past seven numbers, it became a lot tougher to be able to remember the entire chain. Because we can remember five to nine items generally. But if we use chunking, which is grouping items meaningfully, then we can increase the span because each group counts as its own item. So, for example, in this set, if we thought of the two nines as one item, then we group them together, and those two nines became one item, so we could remember an additional item. And also, another way of thinking about those numbers is if you group them into 100s or 10s, that increases your memory a lot. And there are actually masters of this skill, but <laughs> sadly, I'm not a master of this skill. And th this, like I've said, increases your short-term memory capacity. Short-term memory only has an 18-second duration. It's called short for a reason, but it is a lot more than your sensory memory. So after these 18 seconds, if it is not encoded into long-term memory, then it's generally forgotten. And finally, short-term memory uses mainly acoustic and partially visual encoding, which is sort of interesting to note that it doesn't really use semantic encoding. Finally, stage three is long-term memory. And here there is an unlimited capacity of stuff you can memorize, hypothetically. It hasn't really been tested, but as far as we know, you've got an unlimited capacity of things you can memorize. Second, you need to remember that the duration of long-term memory is 18 or more seconds to forever if you encoded it good enough. The duration will depend on how well you remember it, how well you continue to go over it over and over again. Sometimes you forget it in a snap, but sometimes it will always be with you, like a memory that you can never forget. And long-term memory is mainly somatic encoding, as opposed to short-term memory, which didn't use somatic encoding at all. Also, it uses some visual encoding. Okay, the last thing that we're going to talk about today is the serial position effect, which relates short-term memory and long-term memory a bit. Serial means in order, and basically, if a human is given a list of items in a certain order, 
this graph is a representation of what percent they will recall at, at which point the words are on the list. So in the primacy section, you remember most of the words, a high percentage. However, that begins to drop and drop and drop until you're in the middle, in the intermediate section, where it reaches the all-time low. But then it begins to go up and up and up until it almost reaches that of the primacy height in the beginning and the end recency section. It is important to note that the primacy peak at the very beginning is slightly more than the recency peak at the very end. So why do you think this is? I think you can figure this out with your knowledge so far. So if you want, pause the video for a few minutes, write down an idea, think it through. Okay, so you're back. Well, scientists have studied this for a while, and they realize that there is a primacy effect, which it means that there is good recall for the first few items on the list, because uh, for these items, the person has more time to commit them to long-term memory, because they have all the time that the other items are, are read through, basically. On the other hand, there's the recency effect, which, is, which means that there's good recall for the final few items, because these items are still accessible in short-term memory. However, like the graph, like you saw in the graph, this isn't as strong as the primacy effect, because it's only in short-term memory, and that doesn't guarantee that it's going to go to long-term memory. It could just be forgotten after that. And this is why cramming might work 10 minutes before a test. You cram all that information in, and you can recall it for the test, and you get an A on that test. But a week later, the chances of actually remembering that are pretty low, because it was only in your short-term memory and not in your long-term memory. Plus, you probably were using maintenance rehearsal, and we know that that's not as good as elaborative rehearsal, right? Okay, finally, you might be thinking, which model is correct? You've given me four. What do I do with these? So, what do you think? Pause the video for a bit and take a guess. Okay, you're back. So, most likely, the truth is that each theory probably has some bit of truth to it. Most likely, they all integrate together. Currently, psychologists don't know the exact answer to this, but like you can see, there's proof for each one in everyday life. They all make sense for one reason or another. So that's the conclusion. Maybe there's research that's coming out soon that will prove exactly which one's more influential. But for now, we really don't know. It's a conglomeration of all of them. So that's it. That's the end. Tune in next class for Remembering and Forgetting. And just in case you're interested, here's a list of sources where I got my images and the video. See you guys later.